<clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, the Morgan Winery virtual meet and greet, if you will. Um, we're going to wait a few minutes as we allow um, you know people from around the country to be able to join on with us. Uh, my name is Jonathan Apt. I'm the director of sales for Morgan Winery. Uh, I'm excited. We've got a couple of our our other key players who are on this morning. I've got uh, Mark Catino, who's our Western Regional, and uh, Wendy Sullivan, who is our uh, our Eastern Regional. Um, so they're on the call with us this morning. Mark, how are you doing? Great, great. Thanks for uh, tuning in, everybody. Uh, sp special thanks to my territory, uh, Northern California, Monterey Bay Wine Company, and Astoria Wine Group, and I see some. Uh, People from Idaho, Idaho wine merchants, and the boys from Wyoming at Young's Market, and also uh, some people from Southern Glazers in New Mexico. Hope to see you all soon. Thanks for tuning in. I know uh, Wendy's around there. Um, I am. I'm here. I'm under Gab Diekman. I went and signed on on my daughter's oh, there computer. We go. Buddy, so. <laughs> <laughs> I was having problems getting on. So, but good morning, everybody. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to all of our East Coast distributors. We have people on all from New Hampshire all the way down to South Carolina and everywhere in between. You guys have done an awesome job over the last couple of months. And I thank you so much for being on the call today. Perfect. Well, I think uh, I think we're getting close to, to getting ready here. I think we've had a, a lot of people, so I'd like to do some introductions. So uh, we're really excited. Uh, we're, we're coming from you remotely from a few different places here. So uh, out in our vineyard area, we have Dan and Donna Lee, who are owners and founders of the winery that are there. Um, out at the winery site, we have uh, Sam Smith, who is our head winemaker. And uh, the one running everything and, and our next generation in the family is Jackie Lee. Uh, and Jackie, uh, she's our, our guru with everything that, that is uh, our Zoom meeting stuff. And she'll help me uh, kind of moderate and filter in questions and, uh, and everything else that's there. So as, as we kind of start up, um, I think we're going to go out to Dan and Donna. But, um, you know, Dan and Donna, Tell us a little bit, take us back to kind of 1982 or, or even 81, but tell us what uh, brought you guys kind of to the Monterey area. Yes, uh, good question. But first I want to, um, you know, kind of say hi to everybody and hope everybody is healthy and, and, uh, and doing well. Um, you can see we're at the double L, we're at our, our entertainment area, our big oak tree uh, that's kind of right in the middle of the vineyard. Uh, you look behind our shoulders back here you can see the fog is just burning off here this is uh, uh when we first set up here it was completely foggy now it's burning off we see some blue sky it's 59 degrees here uh, that's why we got coats <laughs> that's the on. jacket <laughs> and uh this is typical for the san lucia highlands we get you know this time of year we have fog daily uh it burns off uh, <clears throat> Our warmest part of the day is maybe 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock. Um, it might get to 75 degrees, maybe 80 if we're lucky. And then the, the wind, you know, starts up and starts blowing and cools us back down and pulls that, you know, blows the fog back in in the evening. And so that, that cool sun, the fog, the coolness, uh, little filtered sun and then fog again and wind lots of wind is all part of the, of the San Jose Highlands but sorry Jonathan this is so typical Dan <laughs> you ask him a question and he starts talking about the San Jose Highlands okay okay so uh, 1982 okay Donna you know uh, we started what you know you remember back then there was there was no internet you know, there was no cell phones yeah. I mean we didn't even have a fax machine you know we used words like Hey, that's cool, man. So that's that's the he said uh, answer to your question. The she said answer to uh, tell us how it all started was that we both moved to this area independently in around 1979. Um, uh, Dan was fresh out of Davis. I was out of Southern California. I came up to be a loan officer for an agricultural lender. He came down here to take a winemaker position with a very new winery just being built called Jekyll. You have to realize at that time in Monterey County, there were a lot of grapes, 
but they were most of them were being harvested to go to large wineries outside of the area. And there were very, very few small independent wineries. Um, Dan had no intention to stay here on a long-term basis. His, his thinking was <laughs> that he would put in, you know, pay his dues down here, his friends were going up to Napa and Sonoma to be cellar rats and um, assistant winemakers. He would be a winemaker down here, get his ticket punched, and then spend a couple <clears throat> years and go north. But life happens, right? Um, and while I would like to tell you that he stayed down here because of me, he really stayed down here because of the Chardonnay. <laughs> you're, 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 you're a big part of the reason. <laughs> you know, I realized pretty early on that the coolness of Monterey, uh, it meant that you couldn't grow some grapes, you know. Uh, you know, we can't grow Cabernet and Zinfandel, things that need a lot of heat, but cool climate grapes excel in this area, you know. So at that point in time, Chardonnay was my favorite wine and Chardonnay just was, you know, spectacular out of this area. And so that's, uh, you know, I kind of quickly and you know recognized that, and uh, and we, you know, and it just was very fortunate that one one of the grapes that did really well was what happened to be my favorite wine at the time. It's now, you know, my second or third favorite wine, but in Pinot being first. But uh, uh, thank God, Pinot and Chardonnay are what really do well here, and. Um, so. so yeah, those were the days. 1982 and 1983, our first um, harvest, we made only Chardonnay. So here you have, uh, you can see this is us back in when we were very young and very naive, <laughs> very naive. We started the winery, you know, in 1982, there was a recession going on and I didn't even know what a recession was, you know, I, yeah, I, we were, we were, we were poor. We didn't have any money or anything. And so, you didn't know what that is. We just had a burning desire to start a winery. Well, interestingly enough, I think we misled Jackie on this, on the, on the photo on the left with you in front of the tank. We didn't have those tanks until about 1986, I think. The first couple of years, we used, we used a milk truck, a, a stainless steel tank from a milk we truck. Had, we had a milk <laughs> truck and one tank. We, had, we did have one tank and 50 barrels, you know, so. <laughs> anyway, enough, enough of the old stuff. Let's move on. So, so yeah, what, what takes us into, uh, you know, kind of where we are now, the, you know, the, the Santa Lucia Highlands and, and double L. Yeah. So, you know, as we went on, uh, we started making Sauvignon Blanc in 1984 and then Reds in 1986. And, uh, and then in 1996, we had this piece of land. We, we recognized that San Lucia Highlands was the, the best place to be. And in 1996, this piece of property, the double L, um, was offered to us uh, before it went on the marketplace by a friend, and um, and we 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 bought it. We were we had the money, and and we were fortunate uh, to be able to buy this piece of property. It's a 65 acres total, <clears throat> and with a lot of plantable area, not too much uh, creeks and stuff like that. Um, so it was it were very fortunate, and the San Lucia Highlands is you know. Uh, is our home base now and this vineyard the double L uh, you know is our supplies about 40 percent of our total needs uh, here we show that we planted the bottom um, 25 acres of the very first year and those are little growth tubes and um, so um, some unique things that we do at double L it's differently um, You'll see a little bit later, we have north, north south row orientation, uh, fairly dense. You can see those plants are pretty close together. There, there's about 1,500 vines per acre, which was a, you know, was a guess um, of, of back then, but it, was a, it turned out to be a pretty darn good guess. And um, we, uh, we planted a whole bunch of different clones. Um, and because all those new clonal selections that were the newest and greatest were just coming out, and nobody had them down here, so we planted a whole bunch of them. Uh, and we farmed. Um, we decided to go organic, um, just to kind of respect the land and to respect our our employees, our workers, and 
and to show, hopefully show the terroir um, in this purest form by doing organic without harsh chemicals, harsh herbicides or things that kill microbes and soils and really let uh, nature show itself. So here's, um, I bought a new drone. Uh, <clears throat> it's just, I uh, got some drone shots here. It's our entrance um, right off a of river road. And uh, here's a little shot of our, uh, one of our tractors. He's got a leaf pulling device. He's pulling, plucking leaves uh, right now. Uh, he's still doing that up in the upper part right now. As we come up, we have, the double L is kind of a thin slice, you know, kind of at the northern end of the, of the SLH. And as you come up, you can see how our row orientation is kind of askew because we planted north-south. And um, so we come up, we have this, um, we're coming up to this, this uh, open area here, which we have our bins. Uh, we're under this oak tree here on the very left right now. This open area is eventually going to become a winery site. Um, it's, good. It's, it's nice because it's a, like an amphitheater. Moving into the top part of the vineyard, a uh, little bit different soil up here. It's a little has a little more clay in it. Um, makes life interesting for us. <clears throat> we come up up here. We have one acre of Riesling and one acre of Syrah planted in the upper <clears throat> upper vineyard. And then you come up here to the top, there's the San Lucia Mountains. And, uh, and you sometimes people, when they, they look at the SLH map, they say, well, how come you didn't plant back up here? And this is why you, we planted all the usable acre and then it goes vertical. And uh, that's why you look at the map and it's kind of weird. It's all, all the vineyards are down close to River Road. And this is why there's nothing behind us, uh, even though the the map lines go up to the top of the hills there. So, so those are the Santa Lucias that we're looking at, those, mm -hmm. those mountains. And we'll probably show a map here um, in, a, in a few seconds. And you can actually see how across there, if you go across those, you drop into Carmel Valley and then into the, um, uh, into the Big Sur um, Monterey Peninsula hey, um, area. Jackie or Jonathan, go back to the shot of the double L kids. Okay, so um, Jackie, uh, who are these characters here? I'll answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm the one in the Pocahontas to. shirt, and yeah. Danny, my, my twin sister, is the one with the uh, Telluride shirt with the wolves on it. I think we lived in those. <laughs> So this is where the name um, for uh, the Double Elf Vineyard came from. And the last crop before we planted the grapes was, was um, alfalfa. Here, <laughs> uh, this just, you know, most of you know where the SLH is, where, you know, right off the Monterey Bay, you can see all the, all the coolness and all the, all the wind come off the bay uh, and goes down the valley. <clears throat> Bunch of clones couple different soils. Here's a clonal map where, you know, uh, shows all the different clones we have. We also have eight different rootstocks out there too. So it's a, it's a real mishmash of different so, things. So the pink is Pinot Noir, the, mm. the yellow is Chardonnay, and then the other two kind of um, outliers, if you will, a uh, little bit of Syrah, an acre of Syrah, an acre of, of um, Riesling. You know, I think we had a question about organics. Uh, organics, we, yeah. we, we can. We had, we, can. Uh, we had a number of people around the country, Dan, ask about some of your practices and growing methods uh, in organic or sustainable farming. You know, fortunately, the, the organic program and growing quality fruit is almost identical. Uh, they overlap each other almost 95%. So it was a pretty easy step to go one step further in or and do organic. Um, well, not real easy, but uh, um, we can only use products out here that are approved by the National Organic Program. So, and they're usually natural things that uh, like oils and stuff, um, and uh, but they have to be approved. All our weeding is done with. Um, flaming and hoeing okay mechanical hoeing kind of the, the, the basics of the organics yeah 
So uh, we had a question come across or uh, that we had come in. So this came from Bob Merriman at Young's and Donna, I'm going to pose this one to you because, you know, Donna is our, our numbers person. She knows everything about inventories, where everything is, when it's available, et cetera. <laughs> uh, but Bob wants to know, is there anything new that's kind of come out to the market? Good question. You're right. And you're right, Jonathan. I am the maven of spreadsheets here. <laughs> um, uh, and I tell you, this this whole COVID thing has thrown a real monkey wrench into my predicting and my projecting abilities. But I can tell you with all certainty that we have um, the, the big new thing right now is the rosé. <clears throat> and Sam will get into it a little bit more when he talks but we had to, to delay some bottlings a little bit this year. And that was a real concern because we're used to bottling um, rosé in April and releasing it, you know, pretty much right away because the last vintage is always sold out by that time. And for that to be pushed back into June was, was kind, of, kind of a different um, thing for us to, to think about. But to be honest, I don't know. June may be the best month to release rosé because it's flying out the door and it's it's really exciting. I think well, and the good news is that we really increased production on the rosé this year, so it's it's more <laughs> widely available than it's ever been before. So that's that's kind of important. So, I, yeah. I think you were saying this might be the first year that we have the opportunity to to let some of our wholesale markets uh, sell some of the rosé for this year, which we're, we're really yeah. excited about. Yeah. Um, so I have one other question here for Donna. Uh, Donna also being kind of our uh, our food person with our different events and, and putting stuff together. Uh, Debbie Lawrence from Best Beverage asks, uh, what is the most unusual food pairing with wine that you've uh, you've seen or come across? Well, <laughs> that was a big sad. I'm not sure I'm the best qualified. I, I may be the chief cook and bottle washer around here, but I'm not really the, the resident foodie or song. Um, I thought about this a little bit though, Debbie, and I, I'm not sure this <clears throat> really answers your question, but one of the pairings that I've found works really well over this, over the shelter in place um, uh, happening is paella and Pinot Noir. And that doesn't sound really earth shattering and unusual because Pinot Noir is so darn versatile. It goes with so many, many things. But I just thought the whole, you know, when I was thinking about your question, I thought, well, we've been, we've been leaning into paella quite a bit because there's a place down the road that does paella on Friday nights and we're, we're all about takeout here. Um, and paella is kind of interesting, you know, I mean, you, you initially, my initial thought was, oh, you know, it's got sausage, it's got all this, you know, rich saffron, you know, rice base. I want to go rustic, maybe Tempranillo, something Spanish. Um, but the paella that they make is really big with, um, with the nice big prawns. So there's a lot of that seafood component in it. And so it's like, oh, I want something really crisp and should I go Albarino, you know? And it's, I, I wouldn't call the double Alpino a compromise wine. That would, that's a disservice to say something like that. But it really was one of those wines that hit on all the different requirements with that dish. You know, it was nice and had a, had a nice finish, a nice bright finish, um, but it was rich enough to, to stand up to those, those big flavors. Hey, hey, Dan, bef before yeah. you move on, I've got a quick question from the chat. And mm -hmm. um, Nick is asking, is there a favorite clone at the double L that seems to work particularly well? There, there isn't one, um, one complete standout, but there's several. Um, PO-wise, I think, um, triple seven, six, six, seven, our LT clone uh, in particular seemed to do really well consistently year in and year out. Chardonnay wise, 95 and 96 uh, um, seem to do better um, kind of consistently. We do have a mixed Dijon clone called uh, Roger Rose that does really well. Um, yeah, so, um, but, no real clear single one that stands out over the others, you know, tremendously. <clears throat> Perfect. Well, they're, thank you guys. They're better together. 
<laughs> well, thank you both very much. Um, right now, we're going to kind of fly out from the vineyard. We're going to head over to the winery, and uh, we're going to check in with Sam Smith, who is our, uh, our head winemaker. Sam, you, uh, you were hired back in 2016, so 2020 is going to be your, uh, your fifth harvest. Um, we've loved everything you've done, but, um, you know, welcome this morning. But Sam, maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, kind of your background and, uh, and what you brought to Morgan Winery and what kind of that may differ from, from other wineries. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. <clears throat> Uh, good morning, everybody, uh, or good afternoon to those of you on the on the East Coast. Uh, yeah, so I've been at Morgan for uh, about four and a half years. Uh, 2020 will be my my fifth vintage, and uh, just before having started at Morgan, I, I worked a vintage in the in the Northern Rhone uh, for a producer called Francois Villard. He's in in Condrieu, uh, makes Cote Roti and Condrieu mainly. And uh, just before that, I was uh, living and working uh, for, uh, I was living in Santa Barbara and uh, making, making wines at, at Marjoram Wine Company, um, which does both uh, Rhone and Burgundian varietal wines. Um, and yeah, uh, you know, the past four and a half years have been, have been great. Um, you know, uh, we've been uh, slowly changing a few things here, but, but really just um, kind of, uh, building building up a really really great team uh great camaraderie uh great rapport um and i think everybody here is on uh is really on the same page as far as uh you know a, a you know a close eye for detail and making the best uh the best wine possible so it's been it's been a great experience so far a lot of positivity Perfect. So, uh, Sam, I've got some questions here for you. I have a question from um, Jim Fadden from Perfecta. Uh, he wants to know what is going on at the winery and have you experienced any delays due to COVID-19? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, so I think as, as Donna had uh, mentioned, we have, uh, you know, our bottling schedule has been, uh, has been pretty dramatically affected in the sense that normally in a, in any normal year we have four bottlings, four uh, week long bottlings, and uh, be main you know partly because of COVID and some supply issues that were um, that were exacerbated by COVID, um, it required that we kind of consolidate those four bottlings into three bottlings. So. Um, which are still only going to be uh, a week long. So they're going to be, uh, you know, very uh, full weeks of bottling. But, um, you know, I think that thanks, partly, in, you know, partly thanks to the quality, um, super high quality of the wines that we're bottling, it's, it's, uh, it makes the work, uh, you know, that much more enjoyable. You know, the wines that we've got in tank that are, that are ready to go for, for next week's bottlings are, are some of the best that we've made uh, thus far. They're, you know, it's so exciting how you know high, how high uh, the quality of 12 clones that we've got in tank right now, and uh, all the single vineyard Chardonnays. Um, they're just, you know, they're beautiful wines, and it's and it's exciting that we'll get to put them in bottles soon. So we had uh, this question actually came from multiple people around the country. They wanted to know about uh, a little bit about our barrel program that goes on mm -hmm. in Morgan. Yeah, so uh, at Morgan, pretty much everything goes into a barrel except for Metallico Chardonnay, of course. Um, and every you know whether it's one of our kind of earlier you know earlier to release um, aromatic whites that are only in barrel for uh, you know three or four months or uh, you know, our Pinots and our Syrahs that are in barrel for uh, between nine and 12 months. Uh, they're, they're all aged in French oak, and we only use, uh, you know, really the best oak possible. Uh, it's aged for, for two to three years. And every year, uh, Dan and Dan and I, as well as Patrick, our assistant winemaker, um, we, we, we blind taste through all of our different coopers, and, and we, you know, every year we try to hone in closer and closer into, you know, what is, you know, which are the best barrels that really, uh, you know, kind of um, complement our wines without, uh, 
um, without, you know, kind of covering them up. So we want it to be a kind of a supporting actor um, to the beautiful fruit that we have that, um, you know, comes off double L and some of the other ranches that we um, work with uh, year in and year out. That's cool. Thank you. I have a question here from, uh, from Kelly Cordes from Pacific Southern. Um, she wants to know what's your favorite varietal to work with and why? So good question. Uh, I'm going to have to kind of split that into two, uh, white and red, of course, uh, for the reds, I would say Pinot, uh, because we, you know, at double L we used to have 12 clones. Now we have 14 different clones planted. And there's so much different variation between those different clones, uh, the two different soil types that we have at Double L. So it's just really fun having so many different uh, lots and harvest dates, um, you know, and blending components from from all these uh, different clones and <clears throat> clones and soil types. It's just it's really fun and really compelling. And then for the whites, I'd say Riesling. Um, because again, we're making two different styles of Riesling. We make a, you know, a, a, you know, tiny quantity of dry Riesling for, for wine club. Um, and then a slightly higher quantity of our, you know, our kind of more traditional, uh, slightly off dry <clears throat> double L Riesling. But for both of those wines, we foot tread them, uh, to get, you know, some skin contact for, you know, 10 to you know, 15, 16 hours. And, uh, I think, you know, getting our feet dirty, uh, jumping on the grapes, whether it's once or twice, depending on, um, you know, the amount of extraction uh, that we're that we're seeking. Um, that really um, it makes the wine more personal. It makes it a lot more fun, uh, which also makes it taste better. So it's just uh, it's it's a super fun wine to make, and I think Riesling ages pretty much indefinitely. So um, it's got a bright future as well. Epic. So the next question I have, and this can kind of go out to uh, both you and to Dan. Um, this comes from Kai Larson, Monterey Bay Wine Company. Um, the wines have been getting uh, better year after year. What changes have been made to achieve these results? So uh, I think both Sam and Dan, you guys can kind of chime in on this if you like. So I, I would attribute it to two, two factors. Uh, Partly our team, which is, like I mentioned, I kind of been rebuilding over the past few years. Um, we've just, we've got such a strong team, you know, just so much attention to detail. And that, you know, that of course uh, translates into, you know, super high quality winemaking. And then that is of course supported by, or, uh, you know, highlighted by double L, the quality of double L fruit. Uh, and, you know, double L is um, getting into its 20s. Uh, it's, you know, starting to reach a certain level of maturity. Um, I think the quality of grapes that we're getting off of double L are, you know, is the best that it's been so far. And so I think that the hard work that we're putting into those wines, it's, you know, if, if we if we weren't making good wines, it would be we we'd be uh, you know we'd be somewhat remiss. If we're not making great wines, then we're not doing it justice. And uh, so I think that uh, you know making great wine some wines that are somewhere between great uh, and legendary is just a you know it's a factor of of vintage um, at this point. Yeah. Well, I kind of I kind of work. I kind of work on the vineyard end of things because I, I, in my mind, um, the, the vineyard supplies about 85% of the quality of a wine. So that's where I focus on and just trying to do a better job of uh, farming um, and, um, and bringing best flavors, not, not only from our vineyard, uh, but our vineyards that we purchase from. Fortunately, our the growers that we purchase from are, are probably can teach me a bunch of stuff. Uh, they're really super growers. And so we're very fortunate to, to have a great uh, cast of uh, growers that are just super farmers. And I've got uh, one other quick one here from Paul Stroth at Wine Warehouse. Uh, will any of the wines in the future be certified organic? Well, right now, you know, anything that has double L on it, 
is certified organic, okay? And, um, and we, <clears throat> we can make that with our vineyard, but unfortunately, the Double L is the only vineyard in the San Lucia Highlands that's, uh, that's certified organic. So when we start blending in, like in the 12 clones, which is sometimes 50, 60% Double L, we're still blending in um, 30, 40%, uh, 50% of other vineyards that are non-organic. And we just don't, we just, we don't bother trying to make a claim on those. We just don't think it's, uh, you know, you say 50% organic. I don't know if that really means anything to anybody. So um, it, we just leave those alone. And the <laughs> distinction too is that, that we are uh, certified organic as to the farming of the grapes. I don't know whether the question was yeah, in terms of the wine organic. That's 95% of what's considered organic or maybe 98% out there is, is, is the grapes are organic. And um, what we do, we do add some uh, SO2 in the, in the wine rate to, to make sure the wines are solid and sound and will age. Um, and so they're, they're not 100% organic wines, but uh, just like 98% of, of, you know, people that, you know, have, you know, organic wines, it's the farming, the grapes are organic. Okay. So really quick, before uh, we go on with any other questions, I want to recognize to, to all of our, uh, our wholesale partners out there, we did tell everyone we were shooting for a half an hour, and we know that there's a number of our partners that are in team meetings and we understand that you guys have a finite amount of time for for this so we understand if those people need to sign off uh, we still have more questions and things i think that have come through on the chat as well as uh, the registration so anyone who wants to stay on we're going to answer some more questions and keep going um, but we do understand that if you guys have meetings and you guys need to uh, to sign off for some of those that, that we completely understand. And before you go, we definitely want to say thank you uh, to all those people that do need to go. We appreciate you getting on. We appreciate everything that you do around the country for Morgan Winery. So thank you guys. Thanks, everybody. Again. Thanks, yep. guys. Thank you. Um, so moving on, Jackie, do you have any, uh, any more questions that have come through on the chat during the meeting? Yeah, I've got, I've got one and I'm not sure if we should direct this to Sam or Dan and Donna or preferably both, but um, what are the most difficult varietals to work with? Well, um, I'll, I think I'll, I'll start off answering uh, because it, I, you know, um, there's a couple, I mean, Pinot used to be in the old days um, when before the new clones came out and and how you you kind of treat um, Pinot. But back in the old days, in, let's say 1984 or 1986, when we started making Pinot Noir, um, it was farmed like a big uh, with a big canopy with no leaf plucking, with no letting sun and air in there and it was big crops and it made very mediocre Pinot Noir. And so, but as we improved those practices um, and got the new clonal selections, Pinot Noir went from being very difficult to being fairly easy these days. I don't even think about Pinot as being a difficult wine to, to make. Um, but we have a grape here. We, you know, we have a moderate Rhone program, and um, you know, the biggest item in that is our Cote de Crows, which is mostly Grenache. And I think Grenache is hard to grow. Uh, it wants to put out this big old honking crop, and if you water it at the wrong time, you'll get these big balloony grapes. Um, so I kind of think Grenache is, is one of those varieties that's, that's actually a little bit harder to, uh, to farm than anything else. How about you, Sam? What, what do you struggle, um, what do you find is most difficult to work with in the cellar? You know, I think that um, as far as, you know, fermentation and those, uh, you know, those kind of things are concerned, I'd say Pinot is probably the toughest. Uh, it, it, it kind of it kind of is like what Dan was describing uh, about Grenache in the vineyard. 
uh, but Pinot in the cellar, it, you know, it wants to, it wants to ferment super, super quickly, uh, super hot. Uh, and, you know, kind of our job is to try to, you know, tame some of that. It's to kind of slow down the fermentation so that we can get a little bit, um, a little bit uh, longer time on the skins. Um, we want to get, you know, the, the wine to a certain, uh, certain temperature to get enough extraction, but we don't want it to, you know, get super hot. So we want to, you know, kind of keep the fermentations at a, at a, you know, at a moderate temperature. So, um, yeah. And, you know, the, the kind of the, the, uh, other side of that is I think that Grenache is probably the easiest one to make. And sell it. <laughs> um, <laughs> it has some redeeming factor. <laughs> it, <laughs> it, 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 it ferments slow, uh, not super hot. Uh, it doesn't get very stinky most of the time. Um, it doesn't need a whole bunch of nutrients. Uh, it's, it's kind of the, you know, it's, it's probably the easiest wine to make. It, 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 within the red, you know, the red category at least. <laughs> and hey, Sam. Uh, hey, you Dan. know, when you, when you introduce... Um, with Pinot Noir, you know, we, we do some cold soaking and then we let, uh, and most lots, we let the native yeast, you know, kind of ferment of it through. And whenever you have that situation, you're, you're, it's a gamble. You're, you're tossing the dice because sometimes it's good. Most of the time it's good, but sometimes it's terrible. So that's uh, another factor of making Pinot that's uh, uh, <laughs> iffy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sam's got it all but, under control. <laughs> so we have another question here from uh, Joshua Goins at Wine Warehouse. Um, if you could convey the top three points about the winery or the wines for a sales team or a retailer, what would they be? So, um, hey, you know, that's easy. Um, great quality, um, you know, uh, good customer service and value. I think, and the value part, I think, is really important right now um, because, you know, uh, people are, are not um, spending, uh, they're, they're not, you know, they want to watch their dollars right now. So, I think we give a lot of quality at a moderate price, and I, I'm very, that's one of our values at the winery, as, as well as being green and being organic and trying to be as green throughout our whole um, process. Um, so, in a nutshell, that's kind of what I think we're, you know, best known for. Perfect. So speaking of customer service, we had another chat question that is asking if the winery or the double L vineyard are ever available for wholesale customer visits. Um, do you want to, you want to have Pamela? Um, <laughs> let me, you know, um, the, you're on you a know, roll. <laughs> yes, they are. They are by, you know, kind of like prearranged, uh, especially we love showing the double L off. But in lieu of that, uh, we have a very nice tasting room. Uh, do we have any pictures of the tasting room? Uh, but the tasting room's over in Carmel, and it's open every, well, it will be open eventually every day of the week. It's not open, uh, it's only open three days right now. But um, uh, that in normal times is a great spot because if we know that a, a customer is coming, uh, we can tell the tasting room, they'll give them VIP treatment, they'll, they'll get to taste, uh, you know, things that, that, that normal people aren't tasting and uh, normal, you know, normal uh, <laughs> at no cost, you know, and uh, they get the VIP treatment. And that's open every day, you know, from 11 o'clock to 6 o'clock, um, and it's much more convenient because if somebody's out here visiting, they might, you know, golfing might become the first priority and then, you know, then you can the tasting room is open there every day so you can you can throw that in the mix of your activities and not disrupt anybody it's, so, it's convenient yeah it's very convenient and, and part of that question was who do they contact uh for anyone who wants to come visit the tasting room or you know anything else just contact your regional sales manager from uh from morgan either mark wendy or myself and and we'll make sure we facilitate all that for you. Perfect. Um, well, I didn't see any other any other questions that were out there. Uh, if there's anything we didn't address, please uh, email us. Uh, let us know. We're happy to answer any of those questions. Uh, a big thanks to uh, Dan and Donna Lee, as well as uh, 
Sam Smith and Jackie for putting everything together today. Uh, again, all our, our wholesale partners that are out there, we really appreciate everything that you guys do every day. Uh, we want everyone to stay safe, uh, be healthy, and, uh, and sell lots of Morgan. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. All right. We love you. Thank you all. Take Bye. Care. All right. Bye.